Following um, this talk is Dr. Colleen Begg, who's uh, co-managing the Nyasa Lion Project in Mozambique. Um, Colleen is um, uh, a passionate conservationist. Um, she's highly regarded in the scientific world for her publications. And in 1996, she began the first uh, thorough study of the honey badger in South Africa, which was the basis for her PhD. Her and her husband, uh, Keith, uh, <coughs> have been in uh, Mozambique with the Nyasa project for 12 years, since 2003, and they, with their communities, um, run a very successful program uh, working from, with the grassroots people from the ground up. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Colleen Begg. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I see I can see you this year. So I see a lot of friends in the audience, but I'm not sure whether this is more intimidating or not. <laughs> I'll tell you afterwards. So thank you, Jim. As you can see, that is an amazing program. I have lots to learn from that program. Um, it's been a very tough year for me personally this last year. And so I stand here today, and, and what I'm really doing is that I'm representing my team out there who kept everything going while I was battling. And so, um, I got malaria twice. I got a disease called chikungunya, which is called broken bone disease, which also comes from mosquitoes, um, and was basically had arthritis for, for three months. And then um, in July, my father died, and um, I only found out about it a, a day and a half later, because I was in the middle of the bush and I, I wasn't on email. And I want to just share a story with you which tells you how important our Mozambican team is is I rushed out onto the sandbar with a satellite phone to speak to my mom and I was sitting on the sandbar and Jomba, the man next to Keith there, came up behind me and he just put his hand on my shoulder and he held my shoulder all the time while I was speaking to my mom and tears were pouring down his face. This team is our family and um, so I hope I do them justice today because this is really all about them and the small successes that they've had in a very difficult place. And most importantly, I want to recognize our conservation manager, Agostino, which most of you met last year. Um, he has malaria at the moment, so he is, um, wasn't able to come. And Mbumba Marufo, who is our community manager, they have been incredible. And while I was unable to go into the communities, it was really satisfying for me to know that this program runs without me. And so I am the cheerleader, and I am very enthusiastic about what they do, but our Mozambican team, 95% of which come from the local communities, are running this by themselves. And that's the way that this is meant to be. And of course, this talk is about lions. All of you know what a lion is, unlike tree kangaroos. You grow up knowing what a lion is. But somehow, while we all knew what they were, we missed what was happening to them. And while I was studying honey badgers in the Kalahari with Keith, it was on our watch that the lion population was declining. And it's amazing to me. It's, it's not surprising that we don't, um, that, that tree kangaroos perhaps go crit critically endangered. But how did that happen to lions that their populations fell? So when we talk about lions, the difference as well is that lions breed really easily in captivity. There are more than 300 lions in captivity in the US alone. There are more than 8,000 in South Africa, um, part of the really horrible canned lion hunting um, program and cub petting. So this is not about lions going extinct. This is really about wilderness. This is map is really out of date. It just shows the decline in the lion population. This is from 2006, and the news hasn't been good since then, with only 450 lions left in West and Central Africa, and we think between 20 and 30,000 lions left in Africa in the wild at the moment. So of course this is about wild lions and it's about wilderness. Last year when I gave this presentation and it was put out onto the internet, um, I got some criticism where someone timed my presentation and said I only spoke a very small amount of time actually on lions, that I didn't love lions enough and I wasn't enough of a lion conservationist. And I am completely unrepentant because this is about wilderness, and I don't love one species above another. It's just that my experience 
comes from Lion. And this beautiful Lion is called Fandango, and he's one of the new cubs that has been born in our study area and belongs to the F Pride. And he was actually named by one of the WCN volunteers, Randy, who I'm not sure if he's here today. So I was born in Johannesburg. I'm a city girl. I grew up without ever going into the bush. Until I was 15, year old, 15 years old, my parents eventually succumbed and took me to the Okavango. My father hated it, he hates camping. He's a merchant banker. And, but somehow I always knew what I wanted to do and when I was 10 years old, I had to give a talk about what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I remember starting the talk, imagine waking up on a Land Rover roof in the middle of the bush. And it's amazing how sometimes dreams become reality. Keith and I spent many years on the Land Rover roof until we had children, and then the Land Rover roof got a little bit small. So now we live on a bamboo platform um, in one of the most remote and neglected national parks, national reserves in the world, an incredible wilderness area where we have a very simple camp, and I hope one day if we are not there and a fire comes through, it will all disappear. That's how we like to live. People keep asking me why I don't build a house. I don't want a house in the bush. I want to live in the bush. We have elephants coming to tea. <laughs> and I have an amazing view. Many of you follow me on Facebook, so I sometimes feel that I actually don't need to update you anymore because I update you every first, a second, or every, every day, or every second day. And so it is wonderful to live there. And this, I know some of you have seen this picture before because very kindly Save the Elephants have also trying to be broadcast what a special place Niasa is. It is 16,000 square miles, bigger than Denmark. It is um, twice the size of Massachusetts. There are so few wilderness areas left in Africa today, and this is one of the most significant and one of the most neglected, and we have to do something about it. It lies on the eastern seaboard side of Africa. For those of you who don't know where Mozambique is, there's a blue arrow to show you. Midway between the coast with the town of Pemba and Lake Malawi, which is actually called Lake Nyasa in Mozambique. And it really is about wilderness. It's not just about lions. In 2009, there were 14,000 elephants there. And um, it's also about the smaller creatures. This is the Makula good old lizard. It is a species that is found on the top of only one Inselberg in Nyasa. I could not give you a 20 minute talk about this little lizard and you wouldn't raise funding for this little lizard. But if I talk about lions, I can do that and we'll end up saving all these small creatures as well. And to go back to the criticism that I had about not loving lions enough, I can't choose between my children, Ella and Finn, who, and Ella who's now become an expert at carrying things on her head and doesn't even know, and doesn't even know what an unusual skill it is. She can carry water. <laughs> And just the same way I don't choose between species, although I am passionate about lions, I have enough space in my heart for even the Makula girdle lizard, and that's what we all need to be like. And in the reserve, there are 40,000 people spread across 40 villages. This is as much about people as it is about wildlife. I don't have a community program. We are a community program, and I refuse to distinguish any of our, pro all of it is about people. All of it is about the community, because if we don't get the communities to understand what conservation is about and to want to have the animals there as a benefit, then we would have failed. So our project was established with Keith in 2003, and it's all about promoting coexistence. We've been there for 12 years, and we're not going to be leaving anytime soon. We started, we're researchers, we're biologists, we started from a very um, conservative research background, but we needed to understand what the issues were and what was going on. And so we colored lines, we still do today, to monitor whether we're being effective. And then we followed them to see where they go, what they eat, and why they die. And that information has allowed us to have a baseline against which that we can compare our results to see whether we're being successful. I can't talk about all our programs today. We have 12 programs, and so I hope if some of you support a specific program and I don't mention it, it's not because we've forgotten, it's just because I only have 20 minutes. And so I hope you'll go onto our website or ask me questions, and I'll let you know how they're going. 
So from our research, we were able to identify the threats. Someone asked me today whether I was still following the Safe Behaviors program to keep people safe from attack. And yes, we are, and I, don't even, I wasn't even going to mention it in this talk because I think we have it under control. At the moment, we are focusing almost exclusively, while our other programs are running, on trying to resolve bushmeat snaring. So Mozambique in 1994, when peace was declared after a very protracted civil and colonial, colonial and then civil war, was the poorest country in the world. And since then, it has had extensive growth. And at growth, I understand it's about 7%. Oil and gas companies have moved in. And this has resulted in significant changes. Instead of little animals being made out of clay, we now have cell phones being made as toys. We have big logging trucks which are cutting down forests, particularly in the northeastern section of the reserve, and taking all the hard, hardwood trees out. We have cell phone towers going up, solar power factories. We have communities who now want to have a motorbike rather than a bicycle. And this is just really the human condition. People want to develop, and we can't deny them this. But people are also relying on all the local resources. There's still a lot of fishing, honey gathering, and of course, use of bushmeat for food. This is a very hard picture to look at, and I know you don't want to look at them, but we have to look at them. I have to look at this. At least 13 times this year, I've had to walk into elephant carcasses. This is what homeschooling looked like on this day, and I believe that these are the lessons and we need to tell our children. When I flew over here, I was listening to someone behind me who had said he'd just been to South Africa and had seen a rhino. A South African man next to him said, well, you were really lucky to see a rhino, you might not see them again. And the, the visitor said, why, what's happened with the rhino? Your responsibility and my responsibility is to spread this news and make sure that we still have this. I was able to take Ella and Finn out after that awful day and show them live elephants, which makes it much easier for them to bear. But what if we don't have any more live elephants? Then what are we going to tell our children? And of course, the bushmeat snaring is directly linked to lions, and it's directly linked to food security. People are using bushmeat or wild meat to be able to get themselves an income as well as a protein source. And inadvertently, they are killing lions. And this is not because they hate lions. It's one of those difficult problems to solve. These lions are just caught as bycatch. And sometimes, and very seldom, perhaps three times in 12 years, we have been able to take the snares off the lions. This is not the solution. It makes you feel wonderful, but it's like a Band-Aid. It doesn't, it doesn't um, solve the problem. And so the most obvious solution was to employ the communities in which we work as anti-poaching scouts. Many of our anti 18 anti-poaching scouts are ex-poachers because they want a high status job and they want an income. So we believe in hiring from the communities and probably 50% of our scouts are either bushmeat poachers or ex-elephant poachers. These are the heroes of conservation. I don't have time to tell you the amazing things that these men have done from the communities in which we live. Tackling people with AK-47s when they have been unarmed. Racing off into the dark darkness without night vision equipment. So these men are pretty extraordinary. We have 18 now, of which um, all of them have been trained. Some are on a training course at the moment, and will be back in about 10 days. 45-day training courses organized by the reserve management. The reserve is managed in a co-management agreement between WCS and the Mozambican government. And partnerships of us all working together are essential. Our anti-poaching scouts directly linked to lions pull out snares. But they also sometimes catch suspected elephant poachers. And one reason I wanted to put up this picture was to tell the story that um, when we had some visitors with us, we heard seven shots at night while we were having dinner. The children were sleeping in their tents and they didn't wake up through this whole event. It was terribly scary and we had fishermen running into camp terrified and we had no idea what was going on. I told a similar story last year and I'm telling one now because these things go on. Ezebio, Samuel and Hortensio raced out into the darkness and still over about a 10 to 15 minute period, we kept hearing shots. 
This had a good news element in that our scouts, as well as the scouts of Lewiri, a concession that is neighboring us, managed to catch this man who has been responsible, perhaps responsible, for killing some of the elephants. But my point about this is that when these poachers come into camp, or when these people come into camp, you can't hate them. They are people from the village. And while often, if I talk about poaching on Facebook, people must say we must shoot them and we must, you, you can't do it. These, this is not the problem. The problem is, is the demand and the money that people can make from elephant poaching. And so the most important thing we can do is to go into the communities and talk and listen and figure out what the communities need for them to be able to move away from ivory and bushmeat and skins and, and then make a living. Because that's after all, and I've said it many times before, you cannot do conservation if people are wondering where their meal is coming from and if they are wondering how they are going to afford the medical treatment that they need for their children. And so we've started all our community programs, and I really don't have time to go into them, but Agostino and Mbumbo are doing a fantastic job. This is Agostino's livestock breeding program, which runs like a microcredit scheme. We've now got 52 households in three villages that receive rabbits initially. They then have to pay back their loan when their rabbits breed. They then receive ducks. They pay back their loan of the ducks and receive domesticated guinea fowl so they diversify their livestock and will start eating it and selling it for an income. We also use conservation agriculture to increase the foods in the agricultural fields. This is a very simple picture. The small sack on the, my left hand side was using traditional methods or traditional agriculture. It was 2.7 kilograms of maize. The sack on the, on the right hand side was when they used mulch using conservation agriculture. And the sack in this middle is when they were mixed cropping with beans. It was you know, more than, it was 27 kilograms instead of two and a half kilograms that they harvested from one field. The productivity increased and that is what lion conservation is all about. Many of you know and ask me why we use elephant beehive fences when we are a lion project. It has everything to do with lion conservation because every time we go into the communities they, they complain about elephants and elephants cause more damage than any other animal by crop raiding in the, in the fields and destroying people's livelihoods. And so we partnered with Save the Elephants to put up with Lucy King um, to put up elephant beehive fences which are, which are beehives strung between poles. The elephants come up to the fence they, uh, they knock against it, the bees come out, and the elephants run away. <laughs> so this has been very successful. We have six fences up covering more than 1,100 um, meters, more than 70 hives, and just last month, 11 farmers came to Mbumba and asked if he would please help them put up beehive fences around their fields. These are the kind of programs that we run where we wait for the communities to ask us. We don't force anything on anybody. And so we wait until they can see that these things are successful. And so many of you have been along with us on this crazy journey after these last three years to build the Environmental and Skills Training Center in Nyasa. There are many a day Keith and I have wondered what we got ourselves into. We decided to build an environmental center um, in a concession that we got a 25-year lease on in Nyasa. This we decided to build as a skills training course with completely unskilled labor from the village so that they could get an alternative livelihood. This is the amazing team that we build with, and that's, that face in the back there, that's Romina, who is our pro bono architect, who has been absolutely incredible and made this happen over these, these three years. And end of this year, we will be in budget and on time and ready to open next year in June, July for the first children to come out as well as adults to share everything that we've learned. We have five cottages that have been built with local materials to be able to accommodate people. We have got two guest chalets. And I can't tell you what it meant to me when the bunk beds went in, because I realized that we were actually going to pull this off. <laughs> and um, it has been an incredible journey of pulling down walls that have been um, skew. We have had a lot of visiting architects, 
I mean, artists, as well as people from the local communities that have made the center beautiful. So we have a beautiful elephant bench in honor of Mary Boardman, who supported us so much over the years, who loved elephants. We have a fish bench. Everything is done locally, and I think it has a wonderful spirit. We're still finishing off the refectory, which will be the last place. It's the most complicated roof where people will eat, learn, share. And the library, all the, it's a curved building. It looks like a ship from the top. It's the only building that Romina decided to do as curved walls because it's very difficult to construct. But our construction team has been amazing. And this was built on contract. Um, the roof was done by one of our skills training courses this year. He didn't get paid per day. He signed a contract to finish the building by a certain date, and he had to find his own employers, and he had to manage them, because that was the next step in skills training so he can go off and um, run his own company. We have a vegetable garden at last. So we are finally able to, this is Camilo. He looks after our vegetable garden. We are hopeful that the elephants aren't going to come in and raid it. And there are moments where we can already see this working. This is giving out certificates at the end of the year to our skills training team. We recognize even people that just come every day. They get a certificate for good work ethic because when they want to get a job, they have to provide something that says that they, can, they are worthy of getting um, employment and nobody has anything. We have lots of certificate ceremonies. We have a huge amount of meetings in our reception and office area. And what I love about these meetings is before it was always about people saying yes. We would, off, we would suggest something and people would say yes, 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 but nobody was actually going to do anything. We now have debate. People trust us enough to say they don't agree. We can debate it over an hour, over two hours, and it's a normal conversation of a difference of opinion. And that is exactly what we would like to have. We still are putting a sheet up to be able to show um, PowerPoint presentations. I give the same presentation back to the community at the end of the year because I realized that it's no point just talking to you. I needed to talk to our staff and everybody in the villages. But once the refectory is built, there will be a screen and we will be showing like a Swahili films. Sometimes things happen that make you realize that this is going to work. This was a a uh, fishing family, a uh, mother and father, who had caught a lift with us. And when um, she came into our camp and asked for a lift, she was wearing an ABC kaplana, a piece of cloth that we had developed to increase literacy, home literacy, and also to um, put up in schools as an ABC wall chart. She was wearing it, and she had been using it when she was out in the fishing camps. And when she came into our office, she picked up our ethno-botanical book, which was written in the local language, and showed her daughter the book of all the cultural and spiritual value of the plants. We did nothing. The whole work was being done for us just through educational materials that were locally relevant and culturally relevant. We use every method we can to talk about conservation, whether it is the local dance group or whether it is songs, anything to make conservation in the conversation. So we still have our line fun days. We'll be, this will be the sixth one this year. Uh, and uh, they've really grown to include the adults, not just the children. We have 350 children. It's now been included as a cultural festival for the reserve. And last year, for the first time, we had a 10 kilometer race for this age group particularly, this is the poaching age group. And so we said, okay, we're going to have a race 10 Ks through um, on a track. And we had 26 people that decided to run it. It was in November and very hot. And at the last minute, Keith and I decided to make sure that Azebio followed them in the car because I was concerned that everybody was going to run too fast and that they, would, they weren't going to make it. So Azebio went up to the start line. Everybody took off barefoot. After five kilometers, half of them collapsed on the side of the road. So we piled everybody into the Land Rover. But the guy that won did it in 32 minutes and a few seconds, where the Olympic record is 26 minutes and 17 seconds. They, they did it, no training, no shoes, and in the heat, hottest time of the year. So this year, we're doing it again. We're going to try and beat the Olympic record. And the women have asked if they can run. So the women are... 
The, the first prize is a bicycle. Last year we didn't have much of a, a second prize. Second prize in this year is um, a cell phone or a radio. And then third prize is a t-shirt. And the woman will be running too. So just to recap, to put this all together, sometimes these programs have a habit of you just deciding to do environmental education and then you decide to do rabbits. And I just want to assure you that we do have a plan. We have 25-year goals. We have one-year work plans, five-year goals. Our main long-term 25-year goals are to secure the large carnivores in Niassa and directly mitigate their threats. Our second long-term goal is to develop a model of engaging with communities that works so that we can provide example for all the concessions and the reserve management to show that you have to include the communities. And our third long-term goal is to develop an environmental education program for all the NIASA residents. You should all be asking me now whether we're being successful. So these are my final slides to show you that line attacks have gone down. I haven't put 2014 in yet. The red are people that have been killed. The gray is people that have been attacked by lions. Um, so far this year we've been lucky, but I'll wait until next year to tell you what happens. We have the lion population has been going up. We have more than 1,000 lions in the Yasser, and we'll be doing a survey next year um, to, to keep going in exactly the same way to see what the trend is. We're seeing a lot of cubs. We have two prides of seven in our intensive study area. And the first time we're seeing young, young animals, the impala, waterbuck, kudu, all the prey of lions have all gone up in our intensive study area, which shows you that what we are doing is working. And what's wonderful is sometimes we have lions that we know. This is Fabio, who was born in 2011. I love this picture. I like, for some reason, I like that piece of grass in front of his face. And um, we've just collared him because he's now going out on his own and is independent. And this has never happened before, that we've been able to follow an animal all the way through. So we wish him luck. It's a very tricky time for a young adult. But there's no time for rest. There's a lot that we still need to do. We need to pay attention because sometimes these things happen without us um, being aware of it. We need to collaborate. This is the Wasso Lions team who came to join us this year. And here, just outside here, we have Amy Dickman from the Ruaha Carnival Project. We have Shivani from the Wasso Lion Project. Monica from the Uganda Carnival Project. The African People and Wildlife Fund are here. I'm not sure if Paula Bouli from the Gorongosa Project is here. We all collaborate and we have to. It's not a competition and um, we need all your help too. And that's one thing that I really wanted to say is we need to make sure that conservation becomes a mainstream effort. You need to go out and find all the people that gave you an excuse for not coming today and make sure that they know what's going on. You need to use your talents, whatever they are, to help us because conservationists cannot do it alone. I cannot be responsible for what's happening for lions and elephants in Africa. You have to help us. And then we won't have to name lions. We won't have to count lions. We won't have to follow lions. We can just let them be like this old male who um, had obviously done a lot in his life, who I don't know who he is. I don't know who his pride is, and I don't know what happened to him. Just an old lion in the wilderness, as it should be. And so thank you very much for your attention.